G'day, I'm Graham Lorimer. I'm an environmental scientist and I'm in my element here in a woodland with Mount Dandenong in the background there. And I've spent a lot of my career looking after native flora and fauna. And I put forward this as the first of a series of videos on how to manage environmentally harmful plants in natural and semi-natural ecosystems. But first, I need to provide some definitions. I call a plant indigenous if it's growing in its natural range and in the natural sort of habitat. Most of the plants in this woodland are indigenous here, but this wonga vine I'd say is not. That's because uh, it belongs in a wet forest or a um, mountain ash forest or a rainforest. And prior to 25 years ago, it didn't occur any closer to this than about two kilometres away in the Dandenong Ranges. So I would call this not an indigenous plant. Now you can call a plant like this a weed if you like. A weed is just a subjective term that means that you don't want that plant growing where it happens to be. But for the purposes of managing a natural or semi-natural area, we need a more objective definition of a particular sort of weed. We call them environmental weeds. Here's my carefully crafted definition of environmental weed. It's a plant that is displacing indigenous flora and fauna, except if that plant is displacing flora and fauna as part of a natural cycle. This definition excludes any non-indigenous plant that is not displacing indigenous flora and fauna. For example, annuals confined to the edges of paths. Those plants are not environmental problems, as I'll explain later. Environmental weeds do include any population of an indigenous species that has become so out of ecological balance that it is displacing other indigenous plants or animals. Examples from forests to the east of Melbourne include unnaturally dense regrowth of Yarra Bergen or weeping grass or this small leaf Clematis, Clematis decipiens. I'd call this wonga vine an environmental weed because its foliage is so dense that it's blocking photosynthesis to the plants underneath. And some of the plants around here are actually climbing up other plants uh, to such an extent that it's making shrubs fall down and die. Also, underneath, the habitat for lizards is being impaired. So it's having those negative impacts on the indigenous flora and fauna. Even in a nearby garden, a wonga vine can be an environmental weed because its windblown seeds can blow into this woodland and displace indigenous plants. Sweet is a lovely plant in a garden. What's happened here is that around 30 years ago, this fence was put in. At that stage, the vegetation was the same on each side. On this side, volunteers have continually removed the sweet potosporums, and on this side, the owners of the private land have left them as they are. The result is that, as you can see, there's a much different understory on this side of the fence compared with the other side of the fence, and the whole structure of the vegetation is different there. Have a look underneath the sweet potosporums. The Petosporums compete strongly against indigenous plants for sunlight, soil moisture and nutrients. I've watched the indigenous ground cover slowly die out. The Petosporums are therefore acting as environmental weeds here. A primary goal that many people have for managing natural and semi-natural areas is to eliminate or minimise the non-indigenous plants. A main reason for that is that the sight of non-indigenous plants offends our idea of what a natural area should look like. But what if those non-indigenous plants are of very little environmental consequence at all, like the annual weeds along the edge of the path here? And what if trying to control them is really just a very temporary thing and takes away resources from what could be doing greater environmental benefit? And what if the act of trying to get rid of these non-indigenous plants actually causes harm to the indigenous flora or fauna, such as the locally rare helmet orchids that used to occur along here until they were accidentally sprayed uh, with herbicide? 
what about other environmental weeds that have some redeeming qualities like providing habitat for fauna whose natural habitat has been severely depleted? In these cases, controlling the non-indigenous plants comes with a cost and can be harmful to the indigenous flora. Conversely, sometimes doing things to advantage the indigenous flora and fauna also encourages environmental weeds or minor weeds like these on the edge of the path. For example, I organise a burn in this reserve about every 20 years or so in order to benefit the uh, rare plants that occur here, particularly orchids. And I do that even knowing that that same act of encouraging the orchids will also encourage annual weeds like flea banes and sow thistles to germinate in the wake of the fire. So there's no one-to-one -one correspondence between removing non-indigenous plants and encouraging native flora and fauna. It's all too easy to think that by making an area look more natural by removing non-indigenous plants, we actually make the area more natural and more ecologically healthy. Even if we're not noticing that the penalty for doing that is sometimes to cause harm to the indigenous flora and fauna or to divert resources that should be uh, placed elsewhere. Or that may be very temporary and not really give us any significant benefit. I would encourage you instead to think about uh, not just the way things look and that there are non-indigenous plants present, but rather look for the more fundamental and challenging task of really favouring the indigenous flora and fauna. And in order to do that, you'll need some ecological principles. The first principle is about disturbance and competition. Native vegetation is a hotbed of competition. Periodically I organise a fire in this area in order to stimulate regeneration. It shifts the competition according to different species. For a couple of years, maybe three years after a burn, a particular group of species are favoured, such as these fireweeds that came up copiously in last year's burn. There are also copious seedlings down at ground level. Almost all Victorian ecosystems other than rainforests need those cycles. And in between those cycles there's a range of species that rely on sporadic small amounts of disturbance that might come about from a bandicoot or an echidna digging, scratching the ground and stimulating germination of species. The trouble is that humans have introduced all kinds of plants and animals and fungi. And so when disturbance occurs now, it's just as likely that you'll be encouraging those introduced species rather than the indigenous species. This has major implications for management of natural and semi-natural areas. When there's disturbance, which might even be after you've been doing weed control, you can expect introduced species, not just the natural ones, to take advantage of that. There's an ecological principle that disturbance is the way that environmental weeds become established in natural and semi-natural environments. I'll give credit to the great Australian ecologist Marilyn Fox for pioneering that. And for further reading, I recommend the reference below. Now, just because disturbance is the way that environmental weeds become established in natural systems doesn't mean that they're all worth worrying about. For example, after the fire here, up came a whole lot of flea banes in the genus Erigeron and sow thistles. Species like that only persist for two or three years before they disappear, unless there is ongoing disturbance. So again, you need to consider the disturbance when you're thinking about how to manage environmental weeds. That brings me to the ecological concept of a spectrum of species between opportunists on the one hand and competitors on the other. Opportunists are the species that establish very rapidly when there is a newly available vacant ecological niche. 
and the competitors are the ones that take a lot longer to establish following the creation of a newly vacant ecological niche. And there is a spectrum of species that fall in between the two extremes. So over time, after a, an event like the fire that occurred here, initially there is a, a flourishing of the opportunistic species, particularly daisies like the flea banes I just mentioned, as well as the fireweeds I showed you. But they only last for a couple of years and rapidly they become outcompeted by species that are slower to get started, but eventually outcompete the opportunists because they're often larger and so they capture more sunlight which means they can make better use of the nutrients and moisture in the soil. So we've got this spectrum between the opportunists and the competitors. And how you deal with those as environmental weeds really matters. Opportunists, we know, are reliant on that vacant ecological niche being created. So if it's continually being created, such as by feet on the edge of the path next to me, you will always have the opportunistic species. And trying to get rid of them is fruitless unless you deal with the underlying cause of that disturbance. On the other hand, if you were able to stop the disturbance, such as by closing off a path, here we find that the uh, opportunistic weeds disappear of their own accord. In a long undisturbed environment, opportunistic species disappear over time. But on the edge of the path, the unrelenting disturbance of foot traffic creates conditions that are always conducive to the opportunistic species. And that includes things like flat weeds, as in the case of this cudweed, and ribwort down here, and a range of grass species that are introduced and opportunistic on the edge of the path here. And so these species are going to persist here indefinitely as long as there is foot traffic creating the disturbance. You might also notice that there is a maroon hood orchid just here because it turns out that a lot of orchid species are also somewhat opportunistic. And that's the problem with trying to do too much control of opportunistic species, as well as getting rid of the introduced ones, it's quite likely you're going to inadvertently destroy something like an orchid on the edge of the path. This issue of the relationship between disturbance and the establishment of environmental weeds is of particular importance for floodplains and stream channels, wetlands and shorelines, because those environments are subject to natural continual disturbance, which we can't abate. I think you can see it's quite important to be able to tell whether a species is more on the opportunistic end of the spectrum. Here are three ways that I suggest you can get an idea of that. The first one is to check the root system because many opportunistic species have got very shallow root systems, very wispy root systems. So when you gently pull them up, as you can see here, there's very little to it. The second test is to see whether those species are clustered in the more disturbed parts of the environment, such as along the edges of the paths. And if they don't seem to be spreading beyond that particular part of the environment, it's likely to be an opportunistic species and probably not of too much concern. The third test is to watch how quickly the plant grows from a seedling to reproductive maturity. Now the concept of a spectrum between opportunists and competitors leads me to another ecological concept involving a spectrum. This time between drivers of ecological change on one end of the spectrum and passengers on the other side. Drivers are species which um, are so profound in their impact that they actually cause change. Whereas a passenger species is one which can only really occur there as a result of environmental change. So it's more a symptom rather than a cause of an environmental problem. There are also species that some people called backseat drivers because they're unable to cause environmental change in the outset. But once another driver species transforms the landscape somewhat, then the backseat driver species are able to take over. 
Some people also talk about transformer species, but I don't think we need to get concerned about that. If your objective is to maximise the habitat for indigenous flora and fauna, obviously the environmental weeds you need to focus on are the driver species, not the passenger species. Some of the passenger species may even have redeeming features, such as providing habitat for fauna. Opportunistic weeds along the edge of a path are classic passenger species, and the traffic of feet along the edge that allows them to be there is the ecological driver. Weeds immediately downhill of a, the edge of a road or a railway line are also usually passenger species, and the driver in that case is things like runoff of moisture and nutrients and weed seeds. Dealing with the weeds themselves without dealing with the cause of them being there is fruitless. Unfortunately, it's often difficult to tell whether a species is more on the driver's end of the spectrum or the passenger end of the spectrum or somewhere in the middle. Here are some tests that I use most commonly. The first is just a screening test. If the species at issue represents only a small fraction of the foliage cover of its layer of vegetation, and if it isn't increasing over time without control, it probably has low potential as a driver species. That might not be the case if it has unusual properties such as being quite toxic to wildlife. Conversely, a non-indigenous species that has high foliage cover, like this clematis, is capable of monopolising sunlight, soil moisture and nutrients, and thereby potentially act as a driver. However, it's only a driver if it isn't relying on some other factor to make the environment suitable for it. This panic felt grass is a case in point. It's growing quite densely here, as it usually does under cherry ballard trees. And that makes people often think that it's a real problem and needs a lot of effort to control it. People also find that after controlling it, it keeps coming back and they just cannot get rid of it. So it's developed a popular reputation as the weed from hell. However, the species never moves very far here from underneath the cherry ballarts because of a particular property of what happens to soil underneath the cherry ballart species. And so I would say that this species is not a driver species, it's more a passenger, and the driver is what the cherry ballart species are doing to the soil underneath. And any attempt to remove the panic velk grass without dealing with the driver that allows it to be here is fairly futile. Unfortunately, cherry ballarts are an important part of the woodland here and in a whole range of vegetation types in Victoria. So it's not a simple matter to just get rid of the driver. So in situations like this, in this reserve, we simply have to accept that we are not going to be able to effectively remove panic felt grass. And in fact, that doesn't matter quite as much as you might think, because even in a pristine environment, not many indigenous plants grow underneath cherry ballards, so the panic velk grass isn't displacing a whole lot. My next test for a driver species is to see whether when you remove a species, the environment improves significantly as a result. I've already given you the example of sweet potosporums, where on one side of the fence, where they've been allowed to grow, there is very little native flora and fauna and on the other side of the fence where the sweet potosporums were removed, the environment is much healthier with far more species of flora and fauna. Other scientists have shown scientifically that sweet potosporum can behave as a driver of ecological change in a range of vegetation communities in Victoria. My last and less favoured test is to observe change over time in the absence of any control measures. For example, by watching a species spread across the area of interest, with ecological deterioration occurring behind, but not in front of, what you might call the invasion front. My final ecological principle for this video is what I call Lorimer's first law of weeding. It is, when in doubt, don't pull it out, or don't spray it out.
What I mean is, don't do any harm. If you're uncertain about the, uh, the identity of a particular plant and you think it might be an environmental weed, don't pull it out. If you're unsure whether it's just an opportunistic weed or a driver weed, or on the side of leaving it alone. Until you can check these things, refer to other people who might have a better idea. But you can do far more harm in inadvertently pulling out or destroying uh, an indigenous species or destroying fauna habitat than you can ever make good over a thousand days of uh, doing environmental weeding. To summarise this video, here are what I think are the take-home messages. Number one, when in doubt, don't pull it out. Point two, whether a plant is an environmental weed depends on its capacity to displace indigenous flora and fauna. Point three, ecological disturbances are important for ecosystem health and the survival of some flora and fauna species, but they also promote environmental weeds. Point four, the environmental weeds that depend most on disturbances are called opportunists. There's rarely any point in trying to remove them if the disturbance they thrive on is going to continue. And point five, there is a spectrum between driver species and passenger species, which again helps determine how much importance to place on control of each environmental weed species. But there are other equally important things that need to be taken into consideration when you're working out the priority to be given to a particular environmental weed problem. That will be the subject of the next video.